Yeah, in 2019, my life changed. Buying real estate, doing all these great things. I understood the value of having uh, real estate and wanting to, to hand it over to my legacy, to create a legacy with that. But once I actually went to create a living trust and I saw what it can do, that's when I knew I had a bigger narrative I needed to share with the people. So my thing was, I looked at who created a living trust to hand it down through their legacy. And I said, it's Rockefeller. So I went on to read the Rockefeller Trust from 1934. And also there's a, a, a book called What Will Rockefeller Do? So I stayed up reading all these things about how he would take this, put it in a, an account and only give a portion to the legacy and then have his children create a trust. And now that money compound interest, he wouldn't give it to them until they turn a certain age. And I'm like, I could do that. We can do that. The information was right there. So I sat down with my trust attorney. I said, I want to do that. Like, well, you want to do it, but I want to do that. It can be done. So we structured it, worked it out where if uh, not if, but unfortunately we all pass away. When I pass away, a percentage of my properties would be sold, not the ones that I hold long term. Like I have properties I do keep my short term properties. Those would be sold. That money would now go into a brokerage account. That brokerage account would be in the name of the trust. That money for that specific account would be for my grandchildren starting off not my immediate family. My immediate family would get my life insurance policies, which millions of dollars policies, mm -hmm. and the main properties that I hold. So they're taken care of. But we need to start thinking about the grandkids, the great grandkids, those generations. How do you start their growth? You start their growth by putting that money in a brokerage account and they don't get that money until they turn 21 years old. So let's use the example of a million dollars. I put a million dollars in a brokerage account for my grandkids. They don't get that till they turn 21, gaining 6% interest. 6% interest, they say that's 21. So that money turns into about $3.8 million for my grandkids. My grandkids, they wouldn't get it all. They would get half, about 1.6. So I leave 1.6 in there for my great grandchildren for 21 years. That now turns into about three, four, five, six. That turns into about $6.7 million for my great grandchildren. They don't get it all, they get half. So now that's about 1.1, 1. 1, no, about 2.2.3, 2.3 stays in for my great, great grandchildren. So they get about $8.1 million. You see how that happens? That's compound interest over 21 years. So we have to look at that number, but what makes the trigger and the explosion even bigger is the fact that what Rockefeller did is that was just his trust. What he did was now each Children opened up, each child would open up a trust. So now his children had a trust. So he would pay his grandchildren and his children would pay them. That's twice. So now his grand, his children, then his grandchildren have a trust. So his great grandchildren would get paid three times. So now if we look at Rockefeller Trust paid out now 11 generations and counting continuously. And what he also did was have a life insurance policy on every person in the trust creating his own bank. And now what does that do? This is my structure also. Any one of my children or grandchildren who want to start a business, what do they do? Talk to the trustees. And now you borrow money. We become our own bank. So when someone dies, that money goes into the trust. You pay, when you get the policy, you pay it outright. So now that money is available in the trust. So now also what I did was I retweaked my trust last year and it was 21 that I wouldn't give them money. I changed it. I changed it where they get money at 18 and they can have a business started at 11. You know why? Because now with technology, kids are now figuring out new ways to start a business. So I want them to be able to present a business loan, a business proposal to the trustees so they could borrow money. These are the things where we don't look at them. When people say, I don't have the money to do this, you know what I tell them? Yes, you do. The air you breathe is money. A life insurance policy. Soon as you die, you worth money. Their generations and their groups of people, when people die, their objective is to make sure they have a policy on their grandmother, policy on their father to do exactly what we're talking about. But we look at it as taboo when it can't be taboo. It shouldn't be taboo. The main thing about it is you're thinking about the legacy. And when I tell people, when I speak to you, I'm not speaking to you. I'm speaking to your legacy. You're just a vessel for me to get the message to you so you can hear the message and see it. And it reverberates in your brain. And as it's doing this. You literally are talking to your legacy while I'm speaking, going, I got you. Don't worry. Storm told me how to do it now. I'm going to give me a life insurance policy. When people have a life insurance policy, let's say roughly $4 million, you have half a million dollars left on your home mortgage. 
and you say to yourself, I'm leaving my family a million dollar. Actually, you're not. Because when you die, that policy has to pay half a million to the mortgage so they can stay in the house. You're only leaving them half a million dollars. We don't think about that mortgage behind us. So this is where I say, get yourself a whole life, uh, excuse me, get yourself a term that's for a half a million or a million dollars just to cover the house. So your real policy doesn't get broken up. And now you have that term, pay off the mortgage, any money left, put it in a brokerage account, and now you start the system. So let's stay on this conversation about the trust for a minute. Um, so it's an ir irrevocable life insurance trust or a, a revocable life insurance? You start insurance? off as a revocable, revocable because you want to be able to so sell you, the you, property. And, and you can change it. Yes, 100%. So you can, all right. So, all right. So who set this up for you? Your attorney? Yeah, my estate plan. You told them or they, edu you educated them or they educated you? Obviously, I, they're already educated because they're an yeah. attorney. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like you kind of already had some idea of what you wanted to do because you, you did some reading b before that. Yeah. So what was the process? You kind of said, this is what I want to do. And then they kind of added to it or they said, this is what you should do. Um, I came to them with my plan and my structure first. And, and I really wasn't taking no for an answer because I know it could be done. And there are some people that uh, like there are mechanics who cars are broke. Like they just don't know fully how to do certain things. So you really have to find the right person that does these things. And I would always say, speak to someone who has a trust. Speak to someone who you know they can refer you to someone, but that takes time. But they would give me little tidbits of, well, we can do this, or they have a network of people and a law firm and they reach out to them. Like my first trust cost me about $12,000. My newest one cost me roughly almost 20,000 because I have a lot of things to fund it with. But a starting out trust probably run you anywhere from three to $6,000 but you have to look at the big picture. But I started out having a plan and I really, really was adamant about getting this structure done. That was it for me. You have a will uh, too? Yeah, you know, with the trust, there's a thing called a pour over will that's attached to the trust. For all the items that you don't put into the trust, it automatically pours over and fall into the will, uh, like jewelry, like things that are heirlooms, it'll automatically go in that will. Yeah, I, I'm sitting there thinking, obviously you, you were, Educated. How often are you meeting with your trust attorney? Because I was having a conversation with a young lady the other day, and she's finding it hard to have her parents, you know, even buy into the idea of a trust. So, how often did you meet with family, if you did at all? And how often did you meet with the trust attorney? Is that like a once a year thing, or is it every six months? Because I'm sure you're acquiring properties and other assets throughout the year. Like, how often is, is that happening? Uh, in the beginning, when I started, we had to have a conversation. Literally, it was about almost every other week, sometimes every week to uh, plan us out with insurance and all that stuff. Very complicated. But once it was set, the updating of the trust is every three years, right? Okay. But if there's something of urgency that I need to update, because here's the thing, and I want to throw this part also, I'm going to drop it. Y'all pick this up. When you're buying things in your holding company, your holding LLC should be in the name of your trust. So if something happens to you, the properties automatically fall into the trust automatically fall in there. So you don't have to fund the trust because the trust own the LLC. So if, let me give a, a quick example. You know how you put your name on every single LLC? You open up an LLC, you put your name on it. You open up your LLC, you put your name on it. But if you was to have the property, 123 Smith Street in its own LLC, the name on that LLC would not be you. It would be your trust. So if something ever happens, it automatically goes to the trust because you signed the trust over as the owner. Does that make sense? Yes. Automatically. So with trinkle effect. So with that being said, excuse me. So with that being said, you wouldn't have to fund one at a time. You could just have that trust on it. All these LLCs bow straight in from your holding. But uh, also to, let me not glaze over something you said. It's so important to have the conversation with your family and sit them down and explain because my thing was after everything's said and done, my lawyer, we would have the conversation with each one of them. Here's who's getting this. Who's the trust? There's the trustee. This is what's going to happen. This is what it's supposed to be. I want you to do this. And it's a thing I call a letter of trust, handwritten. I want this copy of this letter in my handwritten form and my signature to be copied to every generation, every trustee, so they can look and go, he thought about me. I want them to see what I meant and why I did this. Because that's powerful. And they will get it and go, 
Man, my great, great grandfather thought about me. So that letter, you don't have to, but the thing is always impact. So you need to have that discussion with your kids, your grandkids. There's only so far trust can go. It only could go to the last person alive in your generation up to a certain age. So like if I have my, my grandchildren, my last one or my, he would have to now take the trust format and restart it again and follow the same thing. Yeah. Trust can't live on in infamy. So you've created the generational wealth mm -hmm. and the other part was just the sustainable wealth. Yep. Like that's the key, right? Because it could get mixed up from generation to generation. Yeah. But what you're doing is pretty much putting up the barriers like, no, we're going to sustain this forever. Forever. <laughs> the biggest, biggest mistake that a lot of people make, unfortunately, when we have real estate is thinking that our children want to be landlords. We can't. We can't assume that they want to be landlords. I had a, a, a friend of mine who I knew through someone else. He died, didn't have a trust, left the properties to his, to his kids in a will. They sold them because they didn't want nothing to do with real estate. That's, that destroyed me because I knew what his objective was. So we need to put things in place to go, okay, if you don't want to be a landlord, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to have a company do this or we're going to sell it put the properties in the brokerage account where it's gaining compound interest to do something. So that's the key. We need to stop, you know, really projecting our, our, our wants and needs on children and grandkids when they're like, yeah, I got my own plan. That's key. Yeah, that's key.